On our planet, there seems to be an infinite number of beautiful places one can visit, with an equal number of spectacular things to admire. It requires nothing more than a curiosity to observe what is all around you. The miracle of nature manifests in countless ways, from breathtaking vistas to the simple movements of a common heifer. The purpose of this program is to present you with the extraordinary diversity of our miraculous blue planet so that you can discover these things for yourself. Today, we will visit three unique islands, Madeira, Taiwan, and Bali. Even though these islands are thousands of kilometers apart, they have one thing in common. All three islands were created by ancient volcanic action that shaped their landscapes into truly wild and unbelievable beauty. We begin in Madeira, several hundred kilometers from the West African coast. This island, still under the rule of Portugal, will absolutely dazzle the first time visitor. You can't help but be impressed by the steep cliffs, high mountains, and unique climate. From Madeira, we will continue to Taiwan. Here we will closely examine Taroko, one of the world's most stunning mountain passes. We will conclude by heading to the mystical island of Bali, where we will descend into the crater of Batur, a monumental volcano. In the year 1491, a storm at sea caused Spanish seafarers to abandon their ship and head for shore. When they ended up landing on the shores of Madeira, they thought they had reached the end of the world. Remember, in 1491, people still believed the world was flat. The sight of dark clouds clinging to the peaks of high mountains frightened the medieval explorers so much, they believed they had reached the gates of Hades. They were, to say the least, reluctant to come closer to Madeira. They overcame their fear and landed in this bay, where the town of Machico stands today. According to local legend, Machico was named for Roberta Machico. As the story goes, she and her lover escaped from England, where their love affair was prohibited. This supposedly occurred a hundred years prior to the first Portuguese sailors landing here. It is difficult to determine whether this story is real or fabricated. In any case, a statue of the Portuguese captain, Tristal Vaz Teixeira, who commanded the Portuguese exploration, stands in front of the local church. Madeira lies 500 kilometers from the African coastline. A volcanic eruption lifted the island from the depths of the ocean. The steep walls of the island extend five kilometers into the ocean, and its highest peak rises 1,862 meters above sea level. Tourist guides often point out that Madeira is more suited for gazing than for bathing. Despite being considered the gate to Hades, Madeira is a very extraordinary work of nature. The island is only 40 kilometers across, but the nature of Madeira is so diverse that you may feel as if you have just traversed an entire continent. We begin in the southern part of the island. Here, the Gabo Garau cliff juts 600 meters out of the sea. It is the second highest cliff in Europe. The semi-island Sao Lorenzo stretches eastward. Its wild coastline resembles Norwegian fjords. The island's interior is wilder still. Volcanic activity formed an enchanting mountain range. Its beauty can be compared to that of the Alps or the Rocky Mountains. Only a few meters higher, we emerge through the cover of clouds onto the Pau de Serra Plateau. Its rugged, windswept landscape could make you believe you are on the moors of the Scottish Highlands. Sharp peaks that snatch the passing clouds account for Madeira's specific microclimate. The weather here is extremely changeable 
as a result of Atlantic currents and strong winds. That's why the weather forecasts are only released with a 10 to 30% accuracy rating. It often happens that while tourists in the southern part are sunbathing, torrential rains are lashing the northern part, and the mountains in the interior are being blanketed with snow. Madeira is sometimes called the island of the never-ending spring. In the north, in the higher altitudes, the locals seek to collect the rainfall. The inhabitants of Madeira long ago devised a complex system of irrigation canals called lavadas. These canals, stretching over 2,150 kilometers, distribute water to the entire island. A picturesque ensemble is created by thousands of colorful fields dispersed throughout the terraces on steep slopes. The cultivation of such fields has always been rather challenging, rendering the use of modern technology here useless. For many centuries on Madeira, agriculture has been the main source of sustenance, but sometimes the land failed to cooperate. To facilitate their ability to respond to land, the people built these quaint little houses. The small dwellings with straw roofing were portable, so that when necessary, the farmers could move easily. As a result, farmers could make the tedious journey to the secluded and inaccessible fields as they required. The complicated accessibility of arable land was aided by an extremely favorable climate for agriculture. Perhaps that explains why some refer to Madeira as the garden in bloom in the middle of the Atlantic. The mild climate is suitable for the growing of vegetables, exotic fruits, and even flowers, a fact that becomes obvious in the marketplace. In the time of medieval expeditionary sea voyages, Madeira was used as a naval base. The ships stopped here to refresh their food supplies en route to unknown, faraway lands. They also refilled their casks of wine. A strong spirit was added to the wine to prevent it from going bad in hot weather and long journeys. The tough life in the rocky terrain affected not only the local agriculture, but the means of travel. A sled is commonly associated with winter and snow, in Madeira, however, a sled is used year-round to facilitate transportation from the hillsides to the valleys. Today, this means of transportation is primarily used as a tourist attraction. The skill with which the men operate their sled is remarkable. The wicker sled hurtles downhill at a speed of 35 miles per hour. To control it, one requires special leather shoes with reinforced soles and years of experience. Considering the rugged topography of the island, constructing the local airport demanded considerable ingenuity. Given the lack of flat surfaces on the island, the runway had to be constructed so as to protrude above the sea. This unique construction resembles a giant aircraft carrier. Therefore, the pilots must operate their aircraft with absolute precision. The smallest mistake could result in tragedy. We will complete our exploration of Madeira right here, at the top of Pico Ruivo. Now, we will carry on in the shadows of Portuguese seafarers towards Asia. While those who first discovered Madeira were frightened, those who first discovered Taiwan were immediately enchanted. When they landed, they called out in excitement, Ilha Formosa, meaning beautiful island in Portuguese. For several centuries, Taiwan was known to the Western world only by the name Formosa. Today, you'll only find that name in old history textbooks or on very old boxes of tea. 
Its Chinese name, Taiwan, is no less poetic and fitting. It stands for a terraced bay. Madeira and Taiwan have one thing in common. They are both the result of volcanic activity. Taiwan is believed to have come into being about 150 million years ago. Here, the earth is still boiling under the crust. Remains of volcanic activity are found in Yangmingshan National Park, located only a few miles from the capital city of Taipei. Hot sulfuric springs rise to the surface through the cracks in the Earth's crust. Taiwan is the world's seventh most densely populated country. Most of its inhabitants are crowded into the northern part of the island. This is because the center of the island is largely inaccessible due to towering, ragged mountains, a reminder of its volcanic past. The highest peak, Yushan, rises to a staggering height of 4,000 meters above sea level. Its height makes it the highest mountain in the whole of Northeast Asia. Yushan continues to grow at a rate of 5 millimeters per year due to the continuous pressure of the Euro-Asian and Philippine continental plates. The effects of the pressure of tectonic activity are also apparent in the Taroko Pass. The pass more or less cuts Taiwan in half. It is 19 kilometers long and runs to a maximum depth of 300 meters. Those who first discovered this pass were from a tribe called Amis. They gave it the simple name, Toroko, which means beautiful. This imposing road through the pass was built in the 1950s. The construction workers were required to climb its steep walls carrying explosives on their backs and baskets. The baskets contained their tools. Sadly, 200 laborers were killed during the construction process. Falling rocks, floods, landslides, and even earthquakes often complicated the tough, manual work required of these construction workers. Earthquakes are not uncommon in Taiwan. Every builder must take that fact into account. Despite its seismic uncertainty, in 2004, Taipei became the city boasting the world's tallest building. Only six years later, this no longer became the case when the Burj Al Arab skyscraper in Dubai was completed. Nonetheless, the Taipei skyscraper remains an imposing work of architecture. It is a fascinating fusion of tradition and technology. Its architect, C.Y. Lee, was inspired by nature, and so his skyscraper resembles a bamboo stem. Bamboo is known for its strength, resilience, and flexibility, while being slim and tall. The building rises 508 meters. Its name, Taipei 101, comes from its 101 stories. It is equipped with an 800-ton stabilization system. Gyroscopes and weights with an ingenious hydraulic system stabilize the building by counteracting gust winds and potential movements of the Earth. As a result, the building was made to withstand earthquakes of up to 7.0 on the Richter scale. The priority for this building was its protection against the forces of nature. From the busy capital, we move back to the very heart of Taiwan. Well-manicured tea plantations adorn the otherwise mountainous landscape. The drinking of tea is an important aspect of the Taiwanese culture. Oolong tea, grown in the local mountains, is ranked among the best and most expensive teas in the world. These bushes are around 60 years old and still bear leaves worthy of preparation for this delicious brew. The fog rising from the Sun Moon Lake, the largest water surface in Taiwan, has a huge impact on the taste and high quality of the tea.
Evidence of the city's tourist popularity is found in the number of day trip boats by the pier and the plethora of little shops in the local streets. But it is customary in Taiwan for the old and the new, ancient and modern, to peacefully exist side by side. The booming tourism industry does not, in any way, disrupt the local way of life. Just as they did centuries ago, the locals hang these little bells in sacred places along the lake shore. They place a piece of paper with their names inside the bells and ask for the Lord's blessing. The Taiwanese culture has deep historical roots. Indigenous tribes inhabited the island long before the arrival of the Chinese. One of these tribes, the Shao, still reside on the shores of the Sun Moon Lake. The legend is told of the Shao coming to the island because of a white stag. It is said that when the Shao pursued the stag, it attempted escape by leaping into the crystal clear water. Its white body attracted a shoal of fish. The Shao caught and ate the fish. The fish were so delicious, the Shao decided to stay. Today, they still consider the lake and its vicinity sacred ground. The tribe still maintains its ancient traditions, though today it only numbers 550. What you see here is an annual ritual in celebration of the harvest. The natives dance around a basket which contains clothes of their ancestors. They express gratitude to their ancestors for ensuring their God's goodwill and a good harvest. As the ritual draws to an end, the dancers create a human chain and go on a procession through the night streets. The first in line bangs a staff on the ground, symbolizing wheat beating. The last one in line sweeps, symbolizing the collection of the harvest. As the ritual draws to an end, so does our journey through Taiwan. We are headed to yet another Asian island known for its natural beauty and rich cultural tradition. Bali is known around the world for its mysterious, mystical ambiance. It is said that Bali is the last place on earth where ghosts and demons still mingle among mortals. The Balinese people believe this and take it for granted. Demons and ghosts are deemed to be their natural neighbors and are treated with utmost respect and reverence. Hinduism is the principal religion in Bali. However, the practice of their religion is strongly influenced by ancient animistic cults. The Balinese enhanced the Hinduism they learned from India with rituals worshiping nature in all its different forms. A deep worship of the trees is typical among the people in Bali. The banyan tree is considered sacred. It is perceived as a symbol of immortality and reincarnation. Long sprouts shoot from its robust boughs and reach to the ground where they take root and form secondary trunks. Thus, the tree continuously grows and rejuvenates. In Bali, volcanoes are worshipped even more than the trees. They are called Gunung Api, meaning fiery mountains. The Balinese believe that mighty demons dwell within. In an effort to appease these demons, they offer frequent sacrifices to the volcanoes. This imposing volcano has two craters. The outer oval crater has become a lake measuring 17 kilometers in diameter and rising 1,500 meters above sea level. The inner crater is smaller, but rises to 1,800 meters above sea level, 
and is still considered active. It last erupted in 1994. The volcanoes do more than just create destruction. The lava expelled during eruptions becomes, over time, incredibly fertile soil. Additionally, clouds accumulate around the peaks of the volcanoes, ensuring sufficient rainfall. In the case of Batur, the lake within its crater adds to the fertile microclimate. The fertile foothills of the volcanoes are ideal for planting rice. Rice is the most important local food staple. The carefully cultivated terraced fields resemble the Garden of Eden. It is the product of hard labor over several generations. The irrigation and cultivation system of the surrounding landscape has been a work in progress for over 2,000 years. The result is an ingenious yet comprehensive ecosystem the purpose of which is not solely the cultivation of rice. The grass growing on the terraces, for instance, is cut and fed to cattle and poultry. Balinese farmers utilize the water system of growing rice. This system is more profitable and at the same time easier on the land. The stems remain in the field after harvests. These are later plowed in bringing together water, bacteria, and fertilizer ensures the fertility of the land. In Bali, rice is harvested two or three times a year. Other crops, such as corn, are sometimes planted simultaneously. The entire village takes part in the manual harvest. It is part of a ritual, wherein the blessing of the harvest is combined with the acknowledgement of the goddess of rice, Dewi Sri. The Balinese people seek to live symbiotically with nature. They are well aware of their responsibility to the environment they live in. Through daily rituals, they express their gratitude for nature's gifts. The climax of the religious lifestyle occurs during the temple festivities. The preparation of the tree worship ritual is in full swing in a temple near the town of Tampaskaring. Women prepare rich sacrificial baskets for the occasion. Rice is an integral sacrificial product. It is offered to the gods in a conical shape symbolizing a cosmic mountain. The individual rice grains represent animals, plants, and people. The sacrifice portrays the interconnection of earthly life with the universe and the gods. Here, colored rice dough is being worked. The villagers create all sorts of festive decorations from the dough. The creations are fried in sizzling coconut oil, and when ready, are put together in intricate patterns with spiritual motifs. From the seashore, where the Balinese come to appease angry gods living in the depths of the Indian Ocean, we bid farewell to the colorful world of Balinese temples and culture. Our journey to the miraculous nooks of our planet comes to an end, for now. On the next exploration of our compelling and bountiful planet Earth, we shall discover that when one hears Mongolia, one should think of more than just the desert and camels. The environment of the Gobi Desert is so diverse, you can find everything from uncharacteristic ice passes to breathtaking waterfalls and lakes. From the Gobi semi-desert, we will move on to the lush, green, northern Mongolian hillsides that provide refuge for Buddhists. 5,000 kilometers further southeast of the Gobi lies Jordan. We will conclude our journey in the footsteps of Indiana Jones, in the Jordanian Petra, and on the shores of the Dead Sea. That's all right here on Miracles of Nature.